The U.S. Air Force is charging ahead with plans to retire the old A-10 Warthog attack jet within the next five years. But there's only one problem. There's no dedicated close air support platform to replace it with. So now pilots are worried that troops on the ground won't get the air support they need in the next conflict. In the 2023 version of the National Defense Authorization Act, Congress approved the Air Force request to begin divestment of the current A-10 fleet, citing the aircraft as too old, too slow, and too expensive to maintain. Divestment means the opposite of investment, for all you average infantrymen. This isn't the first time the United States Air Force has tried to retire the platform, but previous attempts have been delayed after pilots and troops protested the idea. But according to a June 26 memo, the Air Force seems to be getting its way this time with a set timetable to replace the 54A-10s from Moody Air Force Base with F-35As by 2028, and plans to retire the rest of the fleet soon to come. The A-10 is a much beloved airplane, and pilots say that while it's old, no other US aircraft can come close to matching its close air support capabilities or its survivability. So why is the Air Force so keen to replace such a unique platform? Can other aircraft out there truly replace it, or will US troops be left high and dry when the shooting starts? And is the famous 30mm cannon on the nose of the A-10 truly effective, or just a lot of smoke and thunder? Get ready to strap in and fly low as we make a strafing run on all facts of the A-10 Warthog and how the U.S. will fundamentally change how it approaches close air support missions. But before we get into that, I want to tell you about this video's sponsor, AFMA, the American Armed Forces Mutual Aid Association. Established in 1879, they're the longest standing nonprofit financial solutions provider supporting military families and veterans. Their membership numbers exceed 85,000. They offer a wide range of support to the military community through insurance and financial planning services that help to set you up for success after leaving the military. These services include VA home loan mortgages, wealth management, and life insurance. And since American Armed Forces Mutual Aid Association has been around for so long, they know the specific challenges and needs that veterans like us face when leaving the military. It's important to be prepared and start planning for the future. Whether it's a supplement to SGLI or low rate loans to help you through the tough times, AFMA is there to help shore up your family's future. So head over to AFMA.com, that's A-A-F-M-A-A.com, to learn more about how their community of members share these important benefits for life. The A-10 was a controversial plane even before the first airframe went into production in 1972. Experience in the Vietnam War showed the U.S. couldn't rely on old, propeller-driven A-1 Sky Raiders anymore for dedicated close air support. The late 1960s were firmly in the jet age, and even simple rifle and machine guns were bringing down Sky Raiders over Vietnam. In a debate that's kind of much like today's, some theorists in the Air Force question the need for a dedicated close air support platform at all when fighter bombers like the F-4 Phantom II were more versatile and simplified logistics with a common airframe. Others argued that if the Cold War came to blows with the Soviet Union, the US and NATO would need every fighter it could get up high fighting for air superiority. Since fighter bombers were more expensive and approached close air support as a secondary mission, there was a high risk of NATO troops in Europe having to face waves of Soviet tanks and mechanized infantry without sufficient air support. Proponents of a dedicated close air support design argued going for the dedicated approach would yield a cheaper aircraft with specialized advantages and multi-purpose fighter bomber simply couldn't compete with. A specialized aircraft wouldn't need to focus on supersonic performance, for example, so it could be more fuel efficient with longer loitering times over the battlefield, all while carrying more protection and ordnance. While the debate raged, Air Force Chief of Staff John P. McConnell launched the Attack Experimental, or AX, program in 1966 with the goal of designing a powerful but cost-effective dedicated close combat aircraft. The threat of Soviet armor punching through NATO lines in Europe was getting even more dangerous, especially with the rumored T-64 on the horizon. So the US Air Force was getting concerned that 1960s era missiles and rockets might not be enough to stem the tide of Soviet armor. In another hotly debated move, the Air Force started a parallel project with the AX to develop a gun-based anti-tank solution 
that would eventually become the GAU-8 Avenger Rotary Cannon, firing special, depleted uranium armor-piercing incendiary or high-explosive incendiary 30mm rounds at an average rate of 3,900 rounds per minute. Designers believed the low-tech solution of a gigantic cannon at the front of the A-10 would be a reliable alternative to the finicky missiles of the time, for both tank-busting as well as general-purpose ground attack. While no one could argue the distinctive brrrrat, did I do that right? Sounds that the gun makes when firing wouldn't grab the enemy's attention, designers were conflicted about how useful it would be, and if the extra weight wouldn't be better used for carrying more bombs and missiles. Testing showed the gun to be very reliable though, with only one jam after a full 18 months of trials, and the GAU-8 was officially adopted along with the A-10 in 1977. The GAU-8 cannon proved to be so big and powerful that the whole rest of the A-10 had to be designed around the gun and ammunition system. At 19 feet 5 inches long and 4,000 pounds in weight, the GAU-8 assembly accounts for 16% of the plane's weight. While most modern fighters use 20mm rotary cannons for air-to-air -air combat, the 30mm GAU-8 needs to be so much bigger to crack harder targets than the aircraft. The armor-piercing ammunition achieves a whopping 3,300 feet per second muzzle velocity, giving the depleted uranium projectiles the speed and energy they need to punch through vehicles' armor. The gun's effective range is over 1.2 kilometers, though pilots trained to shoot at shorter distances when shooting at the toughest targets like main battle tanks to maximize both accuracy and penetration. With such a high rate of fire, the weight of just the cartridge casings being dumped after each round is fired could significantly change the plane's center of gravity, throwing off the pilot's aim mid-burst. The GAU-8 mitigates this by feeding spent casings back into the ammunition drum instead of ejecting them. The A-10 itself is reportedly very easy to fly, if on the slow side with a maximum speed of 439 miles per hour at sea level. Since the A-10 would be exposed to enemy fire during strafing runs and couldn't rely on speed to evade manned portable air defenses like the Strela or Igla launchers, designers bake survivability into the airframe to keep pilots alive. The cockpit is protected by a 1,200-pound bathtub-shaped casing of titanium armor and a thick front panel of bulletproof glass. The idea behind this protection is not to shrug off direct hits from missiles like a tank would, but instead minimize vulnerability to ground fire and shrapnel from nearby explosions, since many anti-aircraft missiles use proximity fuses to spray a nearby aircraft with fragments, sort of like a remote shotgun. By protecting the pilot and engineering a lot of extra strength and redundancy into the airframe, the A-10 isn't invulnerable, but was built to withstand a lot more punishment than your average military aircraft. Even with this extra protection, the A-10 weighs just shy of 25,000 pounds when empty, which is 6,000 pounds less than the F-4 Phantom II that the Air Force was considering for the A-10's role, which demonstrates how much extra weight and complexity goes into making a supersonic capable aircraft. Both the A-10 and F-4 can carry the same amount of underslung weaponry at about 16,000 pounds payload, but the A-10 has the advantage of the GAU-8 cannon on top of its underslung capacity, all while being about $400,000 cheaper to build than the F-4 in 1965 dollars. Despite having one of the biggest guns in the history of combat aircraft, the A-10 was still supposed to use missiles and bombs as its primary armament in a stand-up fight with the Soviet Union. While early air-to-ground missiles like the AGM-12 Bullpup were difficult to use and inaccurate, missile technology developed rapidly over the course of the AX and GAU-8 programs. The AGM-65 Maverick was introduced in 1972 and quickly became the air-to-ground missile of choice for the US Air Force. Using newly developed TV guidance, the Maverick was much more accurate than the joystick-controlled bullpup and could be fired from higher altitudes where it was safer for the aircraft and pilot. Later versions of the Maverick would add infrared imagers and laser guidance for even greater accuracy in all weather conditions. 
The advancement of air-to-ground missile technology put the A-10 in somewhat of a weird spot, meaning any plane with the right targeting equipment could drop warheads on foreheads from altitudes where the A-10's gun and armor weren't necessary. When a laser-guided Maverick can hit a tank more accurately from 22 kilometers away, the 1.2 kilometer range of the GAU-8 looks a lot less impressive. But it's important to remember that close air support is a mission and not an aircraft type. Close air support is a type of ground strike mission, defined by the Air Force Counter Land Operations Manual as air action by aircraft against hostile targets that are in close proximity to friendly targets. By contrast, ground strike missions that target enemy forces further away from friendlies fall under the air interdiction mission set. While aircraft that are particularly good at close air support missions might be referred to as CAS aircraft, Air Force doctrine has long maintained that any aircraft that can conduct air interdiction missions can also conduct close air support just with a more restrictive engagement rules and closer coordination with ground commanders to prevent hitting friendlies. So if any plane that can strike ground targets can conduct CAS, that seems like a point for those that say a dedicated platform isn't necessary, right? As usual, there's more to the story and the combat history of the A-10 proved it to be a very powerful aircraft with more flexibility than meets the eye. The Warthog got its first taste of real combat during Operation Desert Storm in 1991, where it ironically was used more in the air interdiction role than its close air support role. A-10 squadrons were initially held in reserve during the opening phases of the operation in case Iraqi armored units counterattacked in Saudi Arabian territory. This defensive posture of the A-10 was a replica of how it would be deployed in case the Soviet Union charged across Europe and is a sound operational decision. But it meant many Warthog pilots missed out on the first meeting engagements of the conflict where coalition and Iraqi troops were in close combat. Once the threat of an armored counterattack subsided, the A-10 was unleashed behind enemy lines, attacking Iraqi troop and logistic movements, flying 8,100 sorties and launching 90% of all Maverick missiles fired by coalition air forces in the conflict. The Warthog even shot down two Iraqi helicopters with its GAU-8 cannon, scoring the only two gun air-to-air -air kills of Desert Storm. The final tally for the A-10 in the first Gulf War was an impressive 987 tanks and 1,355 combat vehicles for only six planes lost. Another 14 A-10s were damaged, but able to fly back to base, suggesting that the A-10's survivability was keeping pilots alive in that conflict. Warthog pilots supported NATO forces on the ground, as well as escorted rescue helicopters in the recovery of a downed stealth fighter pilot in March 1999. The low altitude protection and long loitering times of the A-10's fuel efficiency made it an excellent asset in combat search and rescue missions. The A-10 wasn't perfect, however, and the global war on terror saw the A-10 both praised and criticized during operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. On the one hand, troops on the ground generally loved hearing an A-10 was on the way to help when they were under fire. The distinctive sound of a 30mm cannon really gets the freedom juices flowing, and the generous loadout of bombs, missiles, and rockets give forces plenty of options to handle unexpected threats. But on the other hand, the A-10's reliance on low-tech solutions for targeting and engagements led to a lot of collateral damage and friendly fire incidents. The A-10 has the dubious honor of topping the list for the U.S. aircraft in both friendly fire deaths and civilian casualties killing 10 U.S. soldiers since 2001 and 35 civilians in Afghanistan, although that sort of data wasn't collected prior to 2010 and is likely much higher. As a result, officers who had access to the bigger picture had mixed reviews of the A-10's performance, with a senior army commander telling USA Today, first, U.S. forces better do no harm. I didn't want any stinking A-10 flying unless they were going to drop a satellite-guided bomb or other precision-guided munition. 
That was a US Army commander speaking under condition of anonymity. The main sources of criticism were early versions of the plane's lack of modern sensor technology, along with the GAU-8 cannon itself, with pilots mostly having to use binoculars and the Mark I eyeball to identify targets, it was a lot more difficult to identify friend from foe. The problem had cropped up as early as the first Gulf War when two A-10s mistakenly strafed British vehicles, killing nine soldiers. But emphasis on keeping the A-10 rugged and cheap delayed major upgrades to the plane's sensor and fire control systems until the mid-2000s. The $2.2 billion A-10C upgrade program finally updated the Warthog's cockpit from the 1970s era tech it had first flown with, but the GAU-8 cannon was causing as much controversy now as when it was first proposed. While the GAU-8 is a very accurate weapon, by gun standards, it still has much more dispersion than a precision-guided munition. JDAM bombs use GPS to achieve 80% of bomb drops within 16 feet of the aim point, while the latest dual-mode laser-guided munitions can bring that radius down to 3.6 feet. Meanwhile, the GAU-8's accuracy expands in a cone from the muzzle, with 80% of rounds hitting a 40-foot wide circle at maximum range. At 60 rounds of high explosive incendiary rounds a second, that's a lot of potential for hitting something that wasn't supposed to get hit. This isn't to say that suppressing or eliminating a large area of enemy troops with a weapon capable of multiple attack runs isn't useful, but air and ground commanders alike raise concerns that newer weapons can achieve the same effect with a lot less collateral damage. The Warthog is almost 50 years old at this point, meaning that aircraft are having to undergo more and more maintenance each year. These costs are adding up to the point where newer platforms are becoming cheaper to operate per flight hour, with just one major maintenance project being a wing replacement program to keep the planes flight-worthy, costing $2 billion in 2007. The Air Force has proposed cutting the A-10s entirely from the federal defense budget in 2015, 2016, and 2017 in favor of other programs and aircraft, but each time Congress has rejected the idea due to the A-10s popularity among troops and the public. But as new technology enables new means of warfighting, the Air Force appears to have finally convinced Congress that other aircraft can do the same job but better. A big part of the argument for retiring the A-10 is a mirror of the original survivability argument from the 1960s. There doesn't seem to be much room for a big aircraft that flies low and slow in a near-peer conflict, and likely hasn't been for some time. The A-10 has been effective as long as it has thanks to the low intensity of counterinsurgency warfare that the U.S. has been fighting for 20 years. Besides a few manned portable launchers, the Taliban and ISIS didn't have much air defense that could threaten the A-10. And so the Warthog thrived in the asymmetric warfare conditions of Iraq and Afghanistan. Experts say that won't be the case against a potential enemy like China that not only has an air force of its own, but also one of the most sophisticated missile networks in the world. For all its charm, titanium armor isn't enough to protect against the latest missiles with continuous rod warheads that slice through planes like giant circular swords. Flying low to avoid radar also doesn't work against modern surveillance systems, of which both Russia and China have plenty. The threat environment has evolved beyond what the A-10 was built to withstand. A lot of media attention has focused on the fact that the Air Force doesn't plan to replace the A-10 with another dedicated close air support platform. But as mentioned earlier, CAS is a mission, not an aircraft. And there have been fundamental shifts in what air assets are capable of since the 1970s. Multi-role aircraft have fewer compromises than they did 40 years ago. Drones have also evolved from primarily surveillance platforms to potent close air support options in their own right, while requiring less training and maintenance support than an A-10. While none of these alternatives to the A-10 carry the legendary GAU-8 cannon, the usefulness of the big gun approach is more questionable than ever. The gun's tank busting abilities aren't sufficient against modern tank armor. The 30 mm API rounds used by the cannon can penetrate around 69 mm of steel armor at 500 meters, but modern Russian tanks like T-72B3 have 80 mm or more on the hull and sides and way more protection on the front. 
a US Navy test in 1980 determined that the A-10 could kill T-62s only 33% of the time, even with a side approach. So there isn't much chance of achieving more than a mobility kill against later designs. That said, fans of the A-10 are reluctantly starting to accept that the retirement might finally be a reality. While we might not hear 3,900 rounds per minute of freedom roaring over the battlefield for much longer, the distinctive sound of an A-10 on a gun run is unforgettable. I hope you found some information in this video worth giving a like or subscription for. Thank you so much for watching Spare Parts Army. I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy, and I'll see you guys again real soon.